Welcome to the Super Show, Halloween edition. As per usual, I went all out decorating the place. Orange Squash Ali and I are back, and it's time to talk about Castlevania's Symphony of the Night. Castlevania Symphony of the Night was the second Castlevania game directed by Toru Hagihara. It also happened to be the first Castlevania game Koji Igarashi worked on as an assistant director who would later go on to produce, well, practically every future game. Like, like, we're talking over ten of them here. That is a lot. Igarashi felt the previous Castlevania games needed to change because they were too short and had no replay value. Clearly he'd never played a Castlevania game before. Because they're impossible, and you will never beat them. Except for you, one commenter about to comment. I get it! You're better than me! Why don't you just fucking brag about it then? Because you can bet your booty butt cheeks I would. So, Hagihara and Igarashi came together and created what could only be described as... A sleeper hit. Castlevania Symphony of the Night with the black label. Apparently it's rare. Symphony of the Night starts off with a prologue of you playing the epilogue of the former Castlevania game, Rondo of Blood. And yes, I said that in the most confusing way possible on purpose. Set to badass music, you play as Richter Belmont, the hero of both Rondo of Blood and Castlevania Dracula X, climbing up Castlevania's famous stairwell to the final... First final battle, Dracula himself. It was not by my hand that I'm once again given flesh. The VO in this game is epic. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. What does that even mean? In defeating Dracula, a fight you literally cannot lose, you'll finally head to the present day of the game and discover a new mystery. Four years after the events of Rondo of Blood, Richter has now disappeared and gone missing. Meanwhile, Dracula's son, uh, or Alucard from Castlevania 3, has noticed the evil forces at hand, and reawakened from his slumber to take names and kick Dracula ass. Thus beginning the real game. But for the first time in a Castlevania game, your main hero is Alucard and not a whip-wielding Belmont. Alucard, looking, you know, slightly different than he did in Castlevania 3, which was thanks to the brand new artwork of Ayami Kojima, is completely different than the Belmont clan. For one, instead of a whip, he uses a sword. And many other weapons. Not only that, but he has stats, and he can level up. These RPG elements were added because Igarashi felt the initial games were too difficult for average players. Also, it's fun. I like it. Leveling up. Makes me feel good. So good. So with Alucard at the helm, it's time to enter Castle... C Castlevania, where you immediately run into death, who decides to rob you naked and steal everything you're wearing. Although, why... Why are you not just naked? Death steals the clothes right off of you! Does Alucard just wear, like, a backup pair or something? Because that's smart, and I like him. So, naked and all alone, it's time to traverse the massive castle that is Castlevania. First thing you'll notice is that by attacking obviously destructible candles, you won't receive any hearts or anything like that, which was always a staple of the franchise. Weird. Also, enemies now randomly drop weapons that you can collect, like this red rust, which is... which is somehow less powerful than your fist? Yeah! Yeah! Okay! That makes sense. Continuing along, you'll find the Cube of Zoe in our first relic. The Cube of Zoe gives you the ability to finally see drops from the various candles in Castlevania, teaching through gameplay just how important these relics will be. You can also turn these off. I mean, I don't know why you would do that, but you can! So many options! Best game ever! Best fucking game ever! In fact, the entire beginning of the game is designed to teach players through gameplay the new mechanics of Castlevania's Symphony of the Night. You're taught the basics of attacking with an OP build before it's taken away from you. In the entrance, you'll find an obviously breakable rock wall, teaching you some walls can be broken. And with the relic system, the game takes away some of what would normally be basic functions in a Castlevania game, like seeing hearts, and instead makes a special item give you this power. It's a brilliant bit of game design. You see, in doing this, 
It allows Castlevania to give players multiple relics throughout the beginning of the game that will give you a sense of power and progression. And while none of them are particularly powerful, like being able to see the name of an enemy you fight, they still give an immense feeling of satisfaction in finding them and giving you, the player, a reason to be excited to explore this castle. There aren't just enemies who want to murder your face, no! There's all of these hidden items sprinkled throughout, and some of those enemies who want to murder your face just might drop secret weapons and items. I could gush on and on about how great I find the design of this game, and I will! Making your way into the alchemy laboratory, you'll find a magically sealed blue door indicating there'll be alternate paths and shortcuts throughout the castle. You'll also find a plethora of secrets in the game which are all actually rewarding. You'll get things like max HP up, or max hearts up. You know, things you actually want? Why can't more games do that with their secrets? <coughs> you know what, it's Halloween. Orange Squash Ollie, why don't you explain this one? Working your way up the Alchemy Lab, you'll come across the first real boss of the game, Gaibon and Slogra, a callback to Castlevania 4. They're here to teach you that, uh... Uh... That the game... The game is easy... Which is funny, because usually I prefer more challenging games. But, this game does have one thing that I can't resist. A shit ton of things to collect! As I mentioned before, the enemies can all randomly drop rare items, with several of them having fun and game-changing effects. You can also find hidden items all over the place, like these sunglasses. Cool-looking sunglasses that up your defense, and drop your intelligence. Fits like a glove. A glasses-shaped glove. So, personal mission in hand to collect everything ever, we move on past Gaibon and Slogra to find... Hello? ESRB? Yeah, I got something to report. Yeah, take a look at this. Yeah, yeah, did you see that? What What do you mean you can't see anything? It's a phone call. What do you mean? No! No! Onto the Marble Gallery, an area that mainly exists for its massive cock. Clock. And where we find the first friendly NPC, Maria. I've come to destroy this castle. Then we have the same purpose. I'll trust you for now. Wait a second. Why should I trust you? What are you even doing in here? There's like floating marionettes and shit. Did you not see the giant wolves? Zombies? This... THIS thing? Whatever! This leads you further into the Marvel Gallery where... Where... I think... I think somebody's watching me. Which brings you right to the outer wall, an area chock full of easter eggs and secrets. Like take this room, pretty inconspicuous, right? HA! WRONG! Obviously there's a breakable wall containing some delicious pot roast, and clearly if you hold down while in the breakable portion for around 15 seconds, a secret elevator takes you down to a room and rewards you with the jewel knuckles and mirror curious. Frankly, I'm ashamed you wouldn't have noticed that. There's also a teleport room, which allows you to quickly teleport around different parts of the castle for quicker exploration, and you find the long library, home to the librarian. I cannot aid one who opposes the master! What? Why? Why does Dracula have a librarian? Doesn't matter, I guess. Because you have money and jewels and shit, he'll sell things to you anyways. As a completionist, I absolutely love the enemy list, as it shows the enemies you've encountered, and if you've missed any drops from them. Most importantly, he'll sell the Jewel of Open, a relic allowing you to open multiple magically sealed blue doors you'll have found along the way. These doors lead into the underground caverns and royal chapel. Unlike the other games in this series, which were linear action games, Symphony of the Night was inspired by games like Zelda and Super Metroid, with the non-linear map design players must backtrack across as you unlock new abilities. And while Metroid technically created the design philosophy way back on the NES, and Symphony of the Night just sorta of jacked it. Yeah, I don't care. Coincidentally, or maybe not, the director of the game, Toru Hagihara, just happened to be the programmer on the only former nonlinear Castlevania game, Castlevania 2. And everybody's fav favorite Castlevania game. That's... that's what I hear. And while Castlevania 2 got it all wrong, Castlevania Symphony of the Night finally gets the design right. In fact, so much so, that the term Metroidvania was coined and regularly used to describe the style of map design. In retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have made this video. I like this game too much and I'm doing a terrible job at making jokes about it. Uh, uh, look at this boss of the Royal Cathedral. Haha, <laughs> see how easy it is? Isn't that funny? Funny!
Got him. That was a close call. This leads to another encounter with Maria, who finally explains she's in the castle looking for Richter Belmont. It also leads to the Leapstone. You see that little stone right there? You my boo. The Leapstone allows Alucard to double jump, opening up a plethora of new areas for him to explore, as well as giving you the down kick attack. With the double jump, you can now traverse a hidden area beyond the giant clock. This will lead directly into Ulrox's quarter, and contains my favorite track of the game, Dance of Pales, an atmospheric piano ballad. Michiru Yamane was the principal composer of the soundtrack, with every track perfectly fitting in with the castle and aesthetic of the area. In fact, I feel this game easily has one of the best soundtracks on the PlayStation 1. Maybe that's why it was called Symphony of the Night? A? 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 Ulrox's quarters also contains the Sword Familiar, one of the several familiars you can equip who will fly around and help you kill enemies. And you can use the Sword Familiar in particular to break the game! But we'll get back to that. Because now it's time to go into the Coliseum and our first encounter with Richter Belmont. Uh, crush this flea who invades my castle. <laughs> okay, let's make a pact to never tell Maria about this. For defeating Richter's monsters, you'll gain the form of Mist, allowing you to briefly transform into Mist and pass through gates. With this in hand, it's time to return to the library. Here, you can double jump your way up onto a hidden ledge, which will lead you to a gate containing the Bat Relic, allowing you to turn into a Bat, and a boss. And I know what you're thinking here. Dave, this seems super important. To which I would say, you're right, this area is incredibly important. You see, the boss of the area is a lesser demon who summons various enemies to help him fight. Occasionally, he'll summon a Mudman, and this is the only point in the game you can find the Mudman. If you kill the lesser demon too quickly, you'll never encounter the creature again, meaning you won't be able to get the Mudman in the enemy list. In other words, you done fucked up, son! You're welcome. Oh, and you can also use the form of the bat to finally travel up to Castlevania's now broken staircase and finally go to the boss of the game. Not as important. And the boss of the game, none other than Richter Belmont. You mean, you mean it's not Dracula? What is going on? Richter has decided he needs to resurrect Dracula so the battle between the Belmonts and Dracula can last for eternity. Now that is what I call job security. The fight consists of two forms, with the second one actually being fairly difficult for for this game. But in time, you'll defeat Richter and his corrupt ass. What need for the shepherd when the wolves have all gone? I don't know, maybe get a new job? So with Richter's defeat, Castlevania disappears and dissolves into the sky, and Alucard leaves for good. And that's about it. What's that horn squash, Ollie? There's more- Horse squash Ollie! What happened? <laughs> so, as it would turn out, secrets aren't just interspersed throughout the game for fun, but are also vitally important to the story and gameplay. If you traverse into the catacombs once you can fly, you'll find a previously inaccessible area with a strange purple save coffin. Going into it will lead you into a nightmarish dream in which Alucard's mother, who's a human, will start telling him to kill all humans. Of course, as the son of Dracula, Alucard sees through this and realizes it's a succubus, and wait, wait. Does that mean that the mom was going to try and have sex with him? Isn't... isn't that what succubuses do? ESRB? ESRB? DON'T YOU HANG UP ON ME! WAIT! I BEG OF YOU! <sighs> hold up. HOLD UP! What? What? Did she just, like, enjoy a good muffin or something? Listen to that scream! I mean, that's more like the noise I make after eating an amazing batch of pancakes than a death whale. Oh, and for her defeat, you'll get the gold ring, where you actually have to start paying attention to the tediously long item descriptions. God! What is this, a fucking book? Where... clock. Where... clock. It's too hard. It's too hard. Fucking riddles, man! Which leads us to the only portion of the game that ever confused me as a kid. By hitting this lever you can only access after getting bat powers, a TNT tossing skeleton will drop down and destroy the bridge you're standing on. Meanwhile, you'll get the note, something appear near the bridge. 
So what this is supposed to do is clue you in on that an earlier bridge, which is sprinkled with goodies underneath you'll want to get, now has a TNT tossing skeleton near it that you can lure to blow up the bridge and lead you into a new area. But I remember struggling with this when I first played the game. It seems obvious now, and the design tries to entice you to remember the bridge. But look, I was a little cute when I first played the game, alright? It's not the game's fault, I promise you. Underneath, you'll find the abandoned mine, with some of my favorite creepy music of the game, and the catacombs. The catacombs containing one of my favorite bosses, the Grand Falloon, which is a giant floating ball of dead corpses. Now that is what I expect to see in a spooky castle. You'll also find the all-important Spike Breaker armor. This armor allows you to access a blocked away portion in the cathedral that can only be entered by breaking the deadly spikes with your armor, which is somehow attached to your head too, I guess, going past the gate by turning into mist, and opening a magically sealed blue door. All of this leading you to Maria, who will give you the silver ring. In. Tower. I'm at a loss. About how the fuck Maria got into this room? Spikes! Mist! Seal Relic I own! H how? How did you do this? So if it's not obvious by now, the gold and silver ring combine to say we're in Clock Tower, meaning it's time to head back to the Clock Tower where there happens to be a few more secrets. If you stop time, a secret passage will open containing the Alucard set, not to be confused with the Alucard set, which is extremely weak but will give you a plus 30 luck bonus if you equip the entire set. By using the bat, you'll also find the gravity boots. The gravity boots allow you to shoot upwards in the air, and quite possibly the best relic in the game. What can I do for you? Oh, I'll tell you what you can do for me. <laughs> all right, all right. Finally, if you do equip the gold and silver ring in the room, the clock will spin around, opening yet another secret passage and leading you to the heart of the castle. Here, Maria can somehow be found again. She'll explain an evil illusion is controlling Richter and give you the holy glasses to see this. And what do you know? Turns out there's a ball floating around controlling Richter. By destroying this, you'll discover it was none other than... Shaft! Damn right. So, now that we know Richter was being controlled by Shaft, the game is complete. While it's common knowledge now, this right here blew people away when it first happened. It turns out there is an entire hidden upside down castle that is the exact same size as the original castle, just, well, upside down, and presenting new enemies, new challenges, and new bosses. Like this guy, Beezlebub, a giant rotting corpse. You'll also be able to find a plethora of new hidden items and secrets. Take for example the Upside Down Library, which is sadly lacking in the Librarian, but is filled to the brim with... Schmooze? And I know what you're thinking. Oh, those schmooze have a dumb name. What an insignificant random flying enemy. No, you're wrong. The schmooze just happened to have the best drop in the entire game. The... Crystal-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis-sis
Know how I told you to remember the Sword Familiar? Well, after raising it to level 50, it gets decked out, and once the Sword Familiar is level 90 or above, you can use this spell in the Cathedral to glitch out of the wall of the castle and traverse beyond the castle boundaries. This will add tiles to your map and give you a higher completion percentage. Although it was patched in the XPLA version, because Konami doesn't like fun. Not only this, but you can use this very same spell to glitch the Librarian. After beating the game, he sells the insanely expensive duplicator, but throughout the game you'll find various jewels that you can sell to him for a large chunk of change, the best being the diamond. By using the Sword Brothers glitch, you can perform a Librarian glitch to gain over 200 diamonds and sell all of these to quickly buy the duplicator, which leads us to yet another glitch! God, I love this game! Equipping the item Heart Refresh into both item slots will allow you to frame glitch the game. However, you can only find two total, so in order to properly do this, you'll need the duplicator which will allow you to infinitely use your consumable items. You can then glitch through just about any doorway by preventing the game from recognizing you've gone through the door and allowing you to fall through. This allows you access to a hidden, incomplete portion of the game, the Underground Garden. This area lies below the entrance to the game and was never finished for Symphony of the Night. While it is complete in all of its majesty in the Sega Saturn version of the game, Dracula X Nocturne in the Moonlight, sadly, the game was never ported to an English-speaking audience. There's even more secrets in Castlevania I didn't even touch upon, which is part of what makes the game so fun for me. It had so much replay value, as someone who enjoys a well-made collectathon, I might talk about this at some point. I love the game took a risk changing the Castlevania formula. There's secrets and easter eggs all over the game, interesting and fun items to collect, callbacks to former Castlevania titles, and even the ability to play through the entire game as Richter Belmont. If it's not obvious by now, Symphony of the Night remains one of my favorite games. In fact, it's the perfect Halloween trick. Tri Meryl McBosby? What are you doing? <laughs> Damn!